So good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of um, the October ACIP meeting. Uh, we are going to start uh, with um, agency updates, and then before we proceed to the first session on HPV vaccine at 8.30, we have a brief, short, short special presentation. Um, so can we start, Nancy, with CDC? I knew you were going to do it. Good morning, everybody. Um, uh, I have a couple quick updates. Um, the first one actually has very little to do with vaccines, but since it's been in the news so much, I thought I'd start with a brief update on AFM, acute flaccid myelitis. CDC has identified seasonal clusters of AFM in 2014, 2016, now again in 2018. CDC and state and local territorial public health partners and clinicians across the country are working diligently to find a cause for this mysterious illness. We're actively investigating AFM cases and monitoring disease activity. We're looking for risk factors and possible causes for the condition, collecting extensive information on each reported case and a variety of laboratory specimens. We're also consulting with nationally recognized experts from academia, other sectors of government to inform our understanding of AFM. We're investigating all possible causes. The bottom line at this point, even after this being the third year, is we really don't know what's causing this infection. We've looked for all the normal causes. We haven't found it. One thing I want to make clear is that it's not polio. People are in the news calling it a polio-like illness. Um, it presents as a sudden, within a couple of hours, onset of weakness of the arms and legs. Um, it's devastating in a number of children, although some do recover. 90% of the cases are in those less than 18 years of age, and the median age is four. But we know it's not polio because we know what the laboratory diagnostics of polio will show and we're not finding it. Um, we are actively investigating every possible cause and we'll update you when we have more information. Please do look to our website. We report on Monday afternoons updated numbers of both the confirmed cases and the patients under investigation. The second thing I just want to um, brief on is that last week um, we reported in the MMWR the annual results of our immunization coverage data. This is both the um, National Immunization Survey childhood coverage data and the kindergarten um, vaccination coverage data. The um, NIS data indicates that most U.S. parents are protecting their children from vaccine-preventable diseases by making sure they're getting recommended vaccines. But we are seeing an increase in the number of children younger than two years of age who are receiving no vaccines. That means that around 100,000 children under two years of age have not received any vaccines to protect them against potentially serious vaccine-preventable diseases. Parental choice may play some role, but CDC's data really suggests that many of these parents do want to vaccinate their children, but they may not be able to get vaccines for them. They may face hurdles like not having healthcare uh, health professional nearby, not having time to get their children to a doctor, and thinking that they cannot afford vaccines. As you all know, we have a vaccine safety net, and these kids are falling through our safety net, something that I'm very concerned about. Um, and so we're going to be really looking close at that. Finally, I just um, want to say, related to Jeannie's um, presentation yesterday about influenza vaccines, that we do have an app. Um, called Vaccine Finder. It's a free online service where users can search for locations that offer immunizations, and they can be used to um, track potential shortages of vaccines, something that providers and parents can use. We certainly don't want providers showing up at pharmacies and not missing an opportunity because the vaccines aren't there. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you. Um, next, uh, do we want to start with, um, well, we can start, can we start with IHS? Sure. Good morning. Thank you. Um, Indian Health Service has been focusing a little bit more on childhood immunization coverage, and um, we're making some efforts to increase IHS childhood immunization rates. The IHS immunization program has been collaborating with the Great Lakes Intertribal Epidemiology Center in the Bemidji Area IHS office on the Bemidji Area Child Immunization Project. And they held an in-person meeting in uh, Minneapolis in August with immunization coordinators from IHS, Tribal, and the one urban facility in Chicago, along with staff from Great Lakes Intertribal Epidemiology Center, the Bemidji Area IHS office, and the State Departments of Health from Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. 
The purpose of the meeting was to discuss strategies for increasing child immunization rates and to build capacity for providing education, training, and resources. Additional projects to further improve child immunization rates in other IHS areas are also being discussed. And I'll just add a little bit about flu. This is our second year now with a mandatory influenza uh, vaccination policy for our healthcare workers. And that seems to be going uh, really strong. And uh, more and more of our sites are also um, adopting sort of drive up immunization clinics in their uh, facilities. So they'll have certain vaccination days where folks can just drive up and they'll get the vaccinations that way for flu. And that's been a pretty popular thing. One of the barriers to that seems to be uh, the CMS reimbursement for activities outside of the four walls. But um, most sites are willing to forego any kind of reimbursements if they have to to protect their communities. So thank you. Great. Sorry, and we skipped the VA. I apologize. No report at this time since our last report. Thank you. Great. DOD? Good morning. The Department of Defense appreciates ACIP and CDC's continued inclusion of the DOD in this meeting and, C and ACIP's working groups. I have three brief updates from the Department of Defense for ACIP's awareness, including a yellow fever supply update as well as two administrative notes. First, with respect to yellow fever supply, the DOD continues its due diligence managing yellow fever vaccine requests during the current manufacturer shortage. And there are no changes from our June 2018 report, and we continue to judiciously administer current DOD supplies to our beneficiary population. On an administrative note, on October 1st, the Defense Health Agency officially assumed an administrative and management responsibilities of several hospitals and clinics as part of the first of a phased implementation reform plan of the military health system. Congress mandated these changes to create a more integrated, efficient, and effective system of readiness and health care that best supports patients and the Department of Defense. And finally, as part of its outreach portfolio, the Defense Health Agency's Immunization Healthcare Branch has completed the ninth edition of the Immunization Toolkit, a practical hard copy resource for vaccine administrators in the DOD who lack reliable internet access, which is frequently the case with our units who are forward deployed and in austere environments. Thank you for this opportunity to update the ACIP membership. Thank you, FDA. Hi. I wanted to start by saying it's an honor to be here representing FDA for the first time, and I look forward to working with the committee and trying to follow in Wellington Sun's formidable footsteps. Uh, I have three approvals that have occurred since the last uh, ACIP meeting in June that I'd like to mention. Uh, the first one you heard about yesterday, and that was to approve a shortened primary series regimen for uh, Ixiaro Japanese encephalitis vaccine for individuals 8 uh, 18 through 65 years of age. Uh, the second approval you'll hear about in a few minutes, and that was to extend the approved use of Gardasil 9 uh, to individuals 27 through 45 years of age. And finally, uh, recently we approved uh, an extension uh, for the use of a Fluria trivalent and quadrivalent inactivated seasonal influenza vaccines to include children six through 59 months of age. Thank you. Great, thank you. Harsa? Good morning. I want to provide an update on the uh, vaccine injury compensation program. We're continuing to see an uh, increase in the number of claims. Uh, in fiscal year 2018, we had uh, 1,238 claims that were filed with the program. Um, and in that fiscal year, we awarded $226 million uh, to petitioners. And this also went to attorney's fees uh, for costs, including fees for cases that were compensated, dismissed, and interim fees. And um, as always, you can refer to our website uh, to get detailed data uh, about compensation regarding our program. In April, uh, we issued a notice of proposed rulemaking <coughs> Uh, proposing to add the category of uh, vaccines recommended for pregnant women to the vaccine injury table. This is uh, to bring us in compliance with the statute in the 21st Century Cures Act. Um, a public hearing was held in September uh, to provide the public an opportunity to comment on this notice for proposed rulemaking. Uh, the public comment period has ended, and we anticipate to issue the final ruling soon. Great. Thank you. NIH? Good morning. Uh, so just as far to start with some vaccine updates, we've had 
uh, so the uh, implementation of a, a few additional uh, vaccines of uh, important pathogens, uh, additional H5 uh, with the novel uh, adjuvant studies, uh, some additional broadly reactiver uh, universal uh, flu vaccine studies have started, and a, an additional phase one for an RSV study have started. Um, additionally, uh, Zika, uh, a live attenuated Zika virus uh, uh, vaccine has started. The details will be provided in the minutes with links to everything. Um, as far as a few program updates, uh, there's a, f a funding opportunity announcements for uh, the VTU and the VTU leadership uh, that turns over every seven years, and, and it's a very big uh, uh, program uh, with uh, multiple sites that do important early development work. Uh, so that announcement is out there. I think the I didn't write down the closure date, but I think it's January or so uh, that it gets uh, submitted. Um, those the the links for those uh, will be uh, in the the minutes. Uh, we've also. Uh, have a program that uh, is uh, uh, broadly uh, a broad agency announcement for the what's called the Civics, which is a collaborative influenza vaccine innovation center. Uh, so those are just focused on early development work for flu vaccines. Um, so that uh, funding opportunity is out there. Uh, there's uh, uh, one uh, additional. Um, program announcement. This has been going on for, uh, since 2009. Uh, it's, it's a program announcement called Research to Advance Vaccine Safety. Uh, since 2009, it's had 24 awards. Uh, it's a big program trying to improve uh, research uh, in, in vaccine safety. So the links for all those will be provided in the minutes. Thank you. Great. Thank you. And finally, MVPO. Good morning. I'm happy to be here today as well uh, at my first meeting and um, i give you the update from MVPO. So first of all, I'd like to thank you for the upcoming discussion you're going to have on HPV and Gardasil 9 uh, to expand the indication for that uh, vaccine. And um, I'd like to give you an update on what MVPO is doing uh, with regards to uh, following up on the last NVAC report on strengthening the effectiveness of national, state, and local efforts to improve HPV vaccination coverage. So we are taking recommendations from that report, and NVPO is currently working uh, with our partners uh, and within the office of the OASH uh, to implement and formalize a strategy that will address the recommendations from that report. So as a first step, we've established an HHS working group um, that's looking to identify efforts across uh, HHS, that what's going on in HPV, and then leverage those ongoing opportunities. But we're also developing an implementation plan that will include a kind of a three-pronged approach to address the recommendations that came out of that report. Um, one of the first prongs of that is enhancing communications and awareness and an engagement with providers and patients on the benefits of vaccine for cancer prevention. Um, secondly, working with the integrated delivery networks and healthcare systems to implement evidence based practices um, that have demonstrated the ability to increase the uh, uptake of the vaccine. And then last but not least, um, addressing uh, and understanding the challenges and opportunities for HPV vaccination in rural communities. So I'll move on now with uh, adult immunizations, and I'll update you on a little bit of efforts there uh, to improve measurement of both prenatal immunization and adult vaccination. In July of 2018, NVPO and our partners developed a prenatal and an adult immunization status measure for inclusion in the healthcare effectiveness data and information set in 2019. The measures are expected to be utilized by health insurers in evaluating healthcare service delivery and ultimately improve uptake of prenatal and adult immunizations through value-based care. The adult immunization status measure has been submitted as a Medicare candidate measure for inclusion in the merit-based incentive payment system and the Medicare Shared Savings Program. And this measure is currently in the pre-rulemaking process. And if selected, it will be published on the measures under consideration list in December of 2018 to be utilized in the quality reporting programs. So I'll move on now to uh, hepatitis. I'm also the acting director of the H HIV, AIDS, and Infectious Disease Policy Office. And so as such, uh, that falls under me as well. 
Um, I appreciate the expertise and leadership of AS ACIP in promoting the expanded hepatitis A and hepatitis B vaccination, and um, yesterday updating the indications for Hep A vaccine to include the homeless. Uh, as you know, OHADEP coordinates the implementation of the National Viral Hepatitis Action Plan, as well as the federal work group of more than 20 agencies and offices spanning four departments. Um, it is this year that we will begin updating uh, that strategy and hope to have that completed by 2020. We are developing a plan and a timeline for that and for engaging uh, not only our federal partners, but also the broader stakeholder communities for updating that strategy. And we'll be rolling out that timeline within the coming weeks. And then finally, I just wanted to say a few words about the National Vaccine Advisory Committee. Uh, NVAC convened last month, and its topics focused on vaccine innovation and HPV vaccination. And the presentations and webcasts from that meeting are available on the NVPO website uh, at the September 2018 NVAC meeting page. And we will host our next public meeting on February the 5th, 2019, via webcast. And thank you. Great, thank you all so much for those updates. Um, before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge um, two individuals who um, will be participating in their last meeting at this ACIP meeting. Um, the first is Dr. Kathy Newsel, who has been our IDSA uh, liaison for, well, you've been involved with ACIP for at least 16 years, um, and you have constantly been um, just an amazing um, uh, force at these meetings, your comments can frequently shift the direction of the discussion and really help focus us in on the key issues. And so um, for that, we can't thank you enough. She is no longer going to be at ACIP because she uh, is going to be a new member of the Strategic Ad SAGE, which is the WHO Strategic Advisory Group for Immunization. And um, we know that uh, the world will now benefit from um, your enormous expertise. Um, and we can't thank you enough for being here. And we hope this isn't really your actual last meeting, but that this is just a break. Um, the second person uh, we would like to acknowledge today is um, Dr. Rafael Harpaz. He will be retiring from CDC today. Um, you all know Dr. Harpaz as the uh, herpes zoster uh, force of CDC. Uh, he arrived to CDC um, in 1992 as an EIS officer. He's an yeah. adult infectious disease specialist. Um, prior to his uh, embarking on the journey of uh, Zoster, he worked on international and domestic control of hepatitis, uh, programmatic aspects of vaccine delivery, measles, bioterror surveillance, and smallpox vaccination, as well as varicella, mumps, pretty much every vaccine preventable disease. Uh, and since 2004, he has been the lead for uh, the Zoster um, work group for ACIP. And he has, over the last couple of years, shifted those responsibilities over to Dr. Dooling, who will um, do an incredible job uh, as he um, moves on. But uh, Raphael has really just been, um, both to me personally, as well as to I know many of the members of ACIP and many of the CDC staff around us, just a huge mentor in terms of bringing together um, an incredible amount of science and thought and um, focus onto vaccine policy questions and, and how to balance all of the different aspects of decision making and, and helping us make those decisions at ACIP. And so, um, Raphael, we have um, a some, little something from you on behalf of ACIP. This is um, your first uh, MMWR R&R signed by all the ACIP members. And we just wanted to acknowledge you. Thank you. Like to, yeah. Yeah. I, here. Would you like to say a word right here, or would you like to walk up? Um, I'll just. Uh, okay. <laughs> we have five minutes. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Um, I my feelings are very very mixed. I felt like I needed to put this down to keep it straight. Um, it's been wor wonderful working on VZV and Zoster all these many years. This family of viruses has evolved over the eons, as, as species as diverse as oysters to humans, causing asymptomatic infections at one extreme and driving people to suicide at the other due to pain. Um, Zoster is a clinical entity that affects 
um, over a million people, mostly at the vulnerable stages of their lives, when which I am entering. <laughs> um, and uh, so this disease, and, and as you've heard me say on many occasions, um, the cause of the increases in zoster over the years is not really known, and we don't understand why one third of people get zoster and the other two thirds of people don't get zoster. So this disease has a huge burden, and it also ha is, is a fascinating disease which satisfies my ravenous curiosity. And on a more general note regarding the ACIP, um, it's been a real privilege to be able to work on vaccine policy these very many years, trying to make vaccine as um, vaccine policy as beneficial as it could possibly be, both domestically and internationally. And it's been a real privilege and honor to work with you guys and the people who preceded you on this um, big endeavor. And I thank you all. Thank you all so much. So now we are going to um, open um, today's meeting with the uh, HPV session. And so I would like to call Dr. Peter Salaji, who is the uh, ACIP uh, chair of the HPV work group. Good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to introduce this morning's HPV vaccine session. So as you all know, the manufacturer filed uh, SBLA in April of 2018 to expand the age indication for nine-valent HPV vaccine through age 45 years. FDA accepted the application in June, gave this a priority review, and as you just heard, approved the, uh, the application on October 6, 2018. Now, as you remember, we had an HPV session in June of 2018 and that included the following, an introduction and background with an overview, a history of the application for licensure in the expanded age group, HPV epidemiology and the burden of disease, and clinical trial data that was included in the SBLA. Since then, the uh, HPV vaccine work group has been extremely busy with actually a couple of extra meetings. And some of the topics reviewed included the following, HPV epidemiology related to mid-adults, values and acceptability, post-licensure effectiveness data, impact modeling and economic analyses, grade, and recommendation options for consideration. Now, a, little, a word about modeling and health economic analyses. Three models are being used to provide evidence for this policy consideration. All are going through CDC ACIP economic review. Modeling adult HPV vaccination is very challenging, and there are differences in results across the models. You'll hear this. And the ACIP workgroup has only recently been able to review preliminary data. So today's session will include the following. First, we'll have a uh, brief vaccine safety update, um, looking at a question about the relationship between HPV vaccine and primary ovarian insufficiency. And then we'll have a, a, a much longer session on the expanded HPV vaccine age indication. So this will include a background, the regulatory basis for licensure, U.S. vaccination coverage and impact, HPV e epidemiology and post-licensure effectiveness, as well as global HPV vaccination. We'll cover grade, the impact and health economic analyses, and then discuss policy considerations. And we won't have a vote today, but a possible vote in February. I would really like to thank this very active HPV vaccines work group, uh, the other ACIP member, Jose Romero, ex officio members, liaison representatives, consultants, CDC contributors, and our expert and leader, the CDC lead, Lori Markowitz. So now for a brief uh, vaccine safety presentation by Julianne Gee. Good morning. 
Um, this presentation is to update the committee on a recent publication of primary ovarian insufficiency and adolescent vaccination. So our study was published in Pediatrics in August 2018, and in my presentation this morning, I will provide some background on primary ovarian insufficiency, describe the methods we employed, provide or present some study results as well as our study conclusions. Primary ovarian insufficiency, or POI, is sometimes referred as premature menopause or premature ovarian failure. POI is characterized by the following before the age of 40 years. Dysfunction or depletion of ovarian follicles, menopausal symptoms, or reduced fertility. Under the age of 20, POI is uncommon, with an estimated prevalence of one case per 10,000 females. Chromosomal abnormalities, including Turner syndrome, fragile X syndrome, as well as genetic toxic cancer treatment, are known etiologies. And most POI is idiopathic, but may be associated with underlying autoimmune and infectious diseases, such as mumps. There have been many, many post-licensure HPV vaccine safety studies over the past 12 years, and many of these results have been reassuring. However, concerns surrounding fertility following HPV vaccine have developed after a small case series studies were published, as well as reports of POI following HPV vaccination being in the national media, as well as circulating in, in social media, as well as other internet sites. So as a result, we conducted a retrospective cohort study. And the objectives of this study were to identify and describe characteristics of POI in females 11 to 34 years, describe prevalence and age incident and age-specific incidence of POI, and to estimate the risk of idiopathic POI in females following quadrivalent HPV vaccination as well as other adolescent vaccinations. Our study population included females age 11 to 34 years enrolled as members for at least 30 days at Kaiser Permanente Northwest, a vaccine safety data link site, between August 1st, 2006 and December 31st, 2014. We ascertained cases by first searching electronic health record databases for outpatient encounters of select ICD-9 diagnoses, which included codes for premature menopause, ovarian failure, and ovarian dysfunction. The first diagnosis in the study period identified was considered the index diagnosis. We then manually reviewed the medical record of presumptive cases to collect data on diagnostic information on diagnostic and other laboratory testing, symptom onset, and other POI risk factors. Presumptive cases were excluded if they were miscoded, ruled, considered ruled out diagnoses, or when the medical record was unavailable. In addition, we excluded cases of POI with known causes including cancer diagnoses, surgical menopause, and genetic conditions. All remaining idiopathic POI, presumptive POI cases were reviewed and then adjudicated by an OBGYN um, to confirm case status. The case definition used for this study was from the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologists guidelines for the diagnosis of POI. And this definition includes the following criteria. Menstrual irregularity for at least three consecutive months and elevated follicle-stimulating hormone in the postmenopausal range and low estradiol levels on two separate occasions. Many of our presumptive cases could not be classified using the ACOG definition because the diagnostic tests were not consistently ordered by the treating providers. So therefore, the clinical adjudicator was instructed to classify presumptive cases as probable, possible, and not POI, with the criteria noted under each classification type on this slide. As part of the medical record review, we recorded onset when it was noted in the medical record or estimated the onset date on the basis of other information documented in the medical record. Among the probable and possible POI cases, we conducted descriptive analyses, as well as calculated prevalence and age-specific incident rates of idiopathic POI, 
And to estimate risk, we use time-dependent Cox proportional hazard modeling to estimate hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals with the adolescent vaccines of interest. During our study period, we identified nearly 200,000 female members 11 to 34 years. And among these members, the following adolescent vaccines were received as noted on this slide. We identified 120 members with an outpatient coded diagnosis of premature menopause, ovarian failure, or ovarian dysfunction. 41 were excluded um, after initial review. After a second round of review, we excluded 26 cases with a known cause of POI, such as surgical menopause, chromosomal abnormality, or cancer diagnosis or treatment. The clinical adjudicator classified seven cases as not POI, leaving us with 46 it confirmed idiopathic POI cases, of which 33 were considered probable and 13 were considered possible. <clears throat> Among the 46 cases, the majority were white, non-Hispanic females, and this is reflective of the population at Northwest Kaiser Permanente. 20% had met the case definition for the ACOG definition. 17% had a comorbid autoimmune diagnosis. 13% um, had presented with primary amenorrhea, and 9% had a family history of POI. In more than half of our cases, symptom onset occurred in women ages 23 or older, as shown in the lower half of the second um, column and more than half of the confirmed POI cases were patients who were diagnosed at age 27 years or older. And um, the median time from symptom onset to diagnosis was approximately three years. I will note that on the handouts there was a slight error, and so um, for symptom onset 27 to 30 years, it should be 22%. The prevalence of idiopathic POI in the study period was 2.31 per 10,000 female patients. And the incidence of diagnosed POI increased with age from a low of 0.87 cases per 1 million person months in the 11 to 14 year age group to a peak of 12.85 cases per 1 million person months in the 31 to 34 year age group. Among the 46 uh, confirmed cases, 18 had a symptom onset prior to August 2006 and were excluded from, our Cox, from the Cox models. The vaccine exposure status of the remaining 28 confirmed cases are listed on this slide. Note that one was vaccinated with quadrivalent HPV vaccine prior to symptom onset. And this slide just um, includes a little bit more information about this one case vaccinated with quadrivalent HPV vaccine. And she was 16 years old at the time of diagnosis and had received her third dose of quadrivalent HPV vaccine approximately 23 months prior to her symptom onset date. And in this case, um, symptom onset date was estimated as the first her first encounter for delayed menarche. Um, we, we, we think that POI onset likely, was likely to occur prior to this estimated onset date. She was also negative for autoimmune antibodies, neuro, normal karyotype, and had no autoimmune diagnoses. So among the 28 confirmed cases of POI, this slide shows the number of cases um, per vaccine type out of the number of unexposed for that specific vaccine type. We calculated age-adjusted hazard ratios to estimate risk. None of the hazard ratios were statistically significant, all with confidence intervals for each vaccine overlapping one. So studying POI as a vaccine adverse event is challenging for many reasons. First, the time from symptom onset to diagnosis varies, and in this study, the median was three years. Because of the long time period to diagnosis, there is a possibility of underestimating true cases of POI. However, we consider this unlikely, um, as the majority of our cohort were members in the health system for more than 24 months with an average follow-up time of five years. Furthermore, the diagnosis of POI is difficult. Many patients did not undergo all the diagnostic testing to meet the strict ACOG definition. 
For example, many of our patients did not have two of the same hormonal tests performed on different occasions to meet the ACOG definition. And another challenge of this study, it was adequately capturing hormonal contraceptive use, which may mask symptoms and onset of POI and can underestimate true cases. We were unable to adjust for contraceptive use in our study because these data are not routinely collected. However, based on previous studies showing no differences in hormonal contraceptive use among vaccinated and unvaccinated women, we do not think that this did impact our study. So to our knowledge, this is the first population-based study in which POI was evaluated as a possible vaccine adverse event. In this study of nearly 200,000 young women, we found no evidence of increased risk of POI following HPV vaccination or other routine adolescent exposures. We believe that this study should lessen the concerns surrounding the potential impact on fertility from HPV vaccine or other adolescent vaccination. I'd like to thank my um, co-authors as well as the committee. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much. We will move on to the next presentation. Uh, Dr. Lori Markowitz. In this presentation, I'm going to give an, a background on the main topic today, which is expanded age indication for nonvalent HPV vaccine. And I'm going to cover a variety of topics. First of all, data submitted in support of the application, and then data from the United States, including vaccine coverage, impact, and a little bit about epidemiology and sexual behavior, post-licensure vaccine effectiveness evaluations, specifically those that looked at effectiveness by age of vaccination, and then a very brief update on the global vaccine situation. This slide shows licensure before this month and availability of HPV vaccines in the United States. Three vaccines are licensed. Bivalent vaccine is licensed for females age 9 through 25, and quadrivalent and nonvalent were licensed for use in females and males 9 through 26 years. And since the end of 2016, only nonvalent vaccine has been available in the United States, and bivalent and quadrivalent vaccine continue to be available and used widely in other countries. And at the beginning of October, as you heard, um, nonvalent was licensed for age 45 years. And although nonvalent was just recently licensed through this age group in the United States, HPV vaccines have been licensed through age 45 years or older in other countries. However, no country has a public health HPV vaccination program targeting mid-adults, which is how I'll refer to this age group going forward. So as a reminder, the current recommendation for vaccination in the United States is routine vaccination age 11 or 12, and the vaccination series can be started beginning at age 9. Vaccination is also recommended for the following persons if they weren't adequately vaccinated previously, females through age 26, males through age 21, and certain populations through age 26, and males 22 through 26 years may be vaccinated. At the last meeting... Da um, data submitted to FDA for the application to expand the agent range was summarized, and later, after approval earlier this month, FDA published a summary basis for regulatory action. And approval was based on several studies, which I'm just going to review very briefly. First was the results of a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of quadrivalent vaccine that included women 27 through 45 years of age, and the end-of-study results were published in 2011. Second, an observational follow-up study of a subset of women in that base study showing effectiveness against anagenal warts and CIN for up to 10 years post-vaccination, and the 10-year follow-up data were presented to ACIP in June. Approval was also based on several immunobridging analyses, including a cross-study analysis showing non-inferiority of the immune response to quadrivalent vaccine in males 27 through 45, compared to males age 16 to 26. The antibody data in the older males were from an open-label, single-arm study of 150 men. And these were compared to the antibody data 
from males 16 to 26 who were in the quadrivalent efficacy trial that was con conducted to support the original licensure of quadrivalent vaccine in males. The approval was also based on um, extrapolation of effectiveness against the five additional types in the nine-valent vaccine based on a variety of data and extrapolation of safety of nine-valent vaccine in ind individuals 27 through 45 based on safety experience with the quadrivalent vaccine and the now robust safety experience from the nine-valent vaccine in individuals 29 through 26 from the United States. So I'm going to briefly review the randomized controlled trial in mid-adult women called FUTURE-3 and the follow-up study, study that formed the major evidence in the application. This quadrivalent trial in women aged 24 through 45 years was a multinational study that included over 3,800 women. 85% were 27 through 45 years of age. The primary endpoint was a combined outcome of vaccine type six-month persistent infection or vaccine type CIN, grade one or worse, and women were followed for four years. Now this slide shows both the per protocol and the intention to treat results for the combined endpoint and for CIN2+. In the per protocol analysis, which is limited to women who received three doses and who were PCR negative and sero negative to the relevant vaccine type at baseline and through month seven. Efficacy against the combined endpoint was statistically significant at 88.7%, and for the CIN2 plus endpoint, efficacy was high but not statistically significant. There's only one case in the vaccine group and six in the control group. In the intention to treat analysis, Efficacy was lower for both endpoints. And re remember, the ITT population includes women, even those who are DNA or serology positive for the relevant type at the time of enrollment. In this population, efficacy for the combined endpoint was 47.2%. And for CIN2, again, not statistically significant. After the base randomized controlled trial was completed, placebo recipients were offered vaccine, and 685 Colombian subjects who received quadrivalent vaccine in the base study consented to, to, to participate in the long-term follow-up for 10 years. Effectiveness was evaluated by instance probability because there was no placebo group in this follow-up study. Primary effectiveness endpoint uh, was vaccine type related CIN or, or condyloma, and the primary analysis was a per-protocol analysis. There were no vaccine type CIN or condyloma during follow-up. However, there were cases, although just a few, of non-vaccine type outcomes suggesting ongoing exposure to HPV during the follow-up period. Now, data considered for regulatory approval, which I just reviewed, as well as other data and data from other studies, are included in grade, and you'll hear the full grade presentation in the next uh, presentation by Dr. Midas. Of note, there were no efficacy or immunogenicity data of nine-valent vaccine in persons older than age 27 years. The manufacturer is conducting a study of immunogenicity and safety of nine-valent vaccine in women 16 through 45 years of age, and the primary objective of this is to compare the antibody titers and adverse events at month seven in women 16 through 26 with women 27 through 45, and the results are expected in the second quarter of 2019. Now, in this part of the presentation, I'm going to review data from the United States. This will include vaccine coverage and impact data and some data on epidemiology and sexual behavior. This slide shows estimated national vaccination coverage with HPV vaccine among adolescents aged 13 through 17 years from the National Immunization Survey from 2006 to 2017. It, at least one dose among females in orange and among males in blue. The routine recommendation for males for females was made in 2006 and for males in 2011. Coverage among females has increased gradually for at least one dose, reaching 69% in 2017. And coverage among males began to increase after 2011 when the routine recommendation was made in 2017, at least one dose coverage was 63%, and you can see that the gap between females and males is narrowing very rapidly, and this gap was only six percentage points in 2017. 
And this slide shows three-dose coverage through 2015 and up-to-date coverage through 2016 and 17. Up-to-date is the new measure that's been used since the two-dose recommendation for persons starting the series before age 15. In 2017, up-to-date for females was 53%, and up-to-date for males was 44% in this age group. Now, NIS teen does not collect data for older individuals, and we do not have provider-verified data from other surveys in older age groups. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, is one of the national surveys that collects self-reported data. And this graph shows self-reported data from 2015 in 9 to 59-year-old females. At least one dose coverage was highest among 14 to 19-year-olds and 20 to 24-year-olds, about 55%. And reported receipt of at least one dose was lower in the older age groups. And here you see the data for males. Coverage, at least one dose coverage was highest in 12 to 13 and 14 to 19-year-olds, about 40%. And the differences in age by, between males and females is a reflection of the more recent recommendation in males and less time for vaccinated males to age into the older age groups. Now, I'm really showing the data from Anne Haynes to highlight coverage in the older age groups relevant for our discussion today. The U.S. uses data from NIS teen to monitor coverage nationally in 13 to 17-year-olds using provider-verified data. In a comparable age group of 13 to 17-year-olds, the age group monitored in NIS teen coverage in NHANES was lower, about 8 to 10 percentage points. The next few slides will show data on impact of our vaccination program. Now, these data are from NHANES again, where prevalence is being monitored through self-collected vaginal swabs. A decrease in vaccine-type prevalence in females was first detected just four years after introduction among 14 to 19-year-olds, where a 15 percent decrease was observed. And by eight years after introduction, a larger decrease in vaccine-type prevalence was seen in 14 to 19-year-olds, and also a decrease of 61% in 20 to 24-year-olds. And no statistically significant decrease was observed in older age groups through 2014, and more data from this survey will be forthcoming. These data on anagenital warts are from females from 2006 to 2014 from private insurance claims. During this time period, there was a 61% decrease in the 14 to 19-year-olds, shown in red, and a 44% decrease in 20 to 24-year-olds, shown in green. A smaller decrease was observed in 25 to 29-year-olds starting in 2009, and not shown here, there was also a modest decrease in males 20 to 24 years starting in 2009. It's more challenging to monitor cervical precancers. These lesions are detected by screening and diagnosed by histopathology. Both screening recommendations and histopathology terminology are changing in the U.S. These data are from a five-site population-based monitoring project that's collecting data on precancers and screening. Rates of precancers, CIN2+, among estimated screened women have decreased between 2008 and 2015 in 19 to 20 year olds shown in pink and 21 to 24 year olds shown in red. Rates in screen women in older age groups shown in the dash lines, similar to findings from other studies, have been increasing. And these increase, increases are felt to be due to longer screening intervals now recommended and or increased sensitivity of new screening and diagnostic tests. Now we not expect to see declines yet in HPV attributable cancers, but we have good registries to be able to evaluate this. And here I'm just showing you the, the numbers and the burden in, in the U.S. This data are combining numbers from our registries and special studies of typing to be able to estimate the number of cancers attributable to HPV per year in the United States using our most recent data from 2011 to 2015. CDC estimated that during this time, HPV caused about 33,700 cancers each year. Most HPV attributable cancers in women were cervical cancers, and most in males were oral pharynx cancers. Of all HPV attributable cancers, 93% are attributable to types that can be prevented by the nine-valent vaccine. Now, this scheme 
schematic of the natural history of HPV at cervical sites provides context for our considerations on the expanded age indication. Incidence of infection peaks in the late teens and early 20s, and precancers in the early 30s, and cervical cancer in the late 30s and 40s. Because of this, vaccination in adolescence is important to prevent most infections and subsequent disease. Due to the complex natural history of HPV and many unknowns, modeling has really been crucial to provide guidance for vaccine policy. And this slide, which I also showed in June, shows results from applying a well-documented natural history model based on the U.S. data to address the question, what proportion of cervical cancers are caused by HPV infections acquired at different ages? And this model estimated that among all cervical cancers in the U.S., 50% are due to an HPV infection acquired by age 21, and 75% by 31. And this, of course, strongly supports routine vaccination at, the, at a young age to prevent the most infections, but also projects that some cancers are due to infections that occur at a later age. And less is known about the natural history of other HPV attributable cancers, and similar model projections have not been made for non-cervical cancers. While well, vaccine trials found high efficacy in mid-adult women naive to vaccine type infection at the time of vaccination, the benefit and potential impact of HPV vaccination in this age group will be influenced by the likelihood of persons in this age group already having had an HPV inf vaccine type infection, immunity after natural infection, the risk of incident infection, and the risk of development of disease from that infection, as well as vaccine efficacy against reinfection after a clearance of a vaccine type. I'm going to show some data from, that we have from the U.S. on HPV epidemiology. This slide shows national data on any HPV type prevalence by age group and sex. Prevalence increases steeply in the late teens and early 20s with onset of sexual activity. And the rise continues through 20 to 24 in females and 25 to 29 in males. By sex, patterns of prevalence different, differ. For females, prevalence is lower in older age groups after 20 to 24, but among males, prevalence was similar in age groups 25 through 29 and older. It's important to note that when HPV is detected among adults, it indicates current infection, but one cannot distinguish between new, persistent, or redetection of a previously acquired infection. For most, both males and females, prevalence in older age groups is more strongly associated with lifetime partners than with recent partners, and much of HPV detected in older age groups is felt to be prevalent and not incident infection. There, I want to also remind everyone that these are cross-sectional data, and some of the differences by age group could be due to cohort effects. Now, do we have estimates on susceptibility to nine-valent type infection in mid-adults? For this question, we looked at data from 2005 and 6, pre-vaccine era data, and the only years for which we have nine valent serology in this national survey. And it's important to remember that DNA and antibody are really imperfect measures of current and past infection, and both depend on the sensitivity of the assays. And importantly, not all persons develop detectable antibody after infection and development of antibody is higher than males and females, and it's also type-specific. This slide shows any nine-valent HPV-type DNA detection in females by 10-year age groups in yellow and seropositivity in purple, and the top line is DNA or seropositivity. DNA positivity in yellow was highest in 20 to 29-year-olds, just over 20%. And seroprevalence is substantially higher than DNA prevalence in all age groups, since most infections clear DNA will underestimate past infection. Among 20 to 29-year-olds, about 45% had serologic evidence of exposure to at least one of the nine-valent HPV types. DNA prevalence and seroprevalence decline with increasing age. Declines in prevalence are thought to be due to clearance of infection and less exposure, and antibody declines due to titers falling below detectable levels, but again, these could be due to cohort effects. 
And in the top line, you can see the measure of any nonvalent HPV, DNA, or seropositivity. And with this combined measure, over 50% of 20 to 29-year-olds had evidence of infection or past exposure with at least one type. And since only 50 to 70% of females who have infection develop antibody, the proportion in this age group with either current or past infection is substantially higher and could be as high as 90%. However, no one had evidence of infection or past exposure to all nine HPV types. And on the right is the seroprevalence among males. We do not have DNA from this time period. Seroprevalence is much lower in males, and it's well known from prospective studies that a smaller percent develop antibody after infection. Now, while HPV incidence is lower in mid-adult women than in women in their teens and early 20s, new infections do occur, and we, again, reviewed some of these data at the last meeting. And because it's difficult to distinguish new infection from redetection of a prior infection, studies have been designed to evaluate new incident infection by using sexual behavior to estimate recent um, exposure and past sexual exposure. And I just want to mention briefly these two studies. In the Weiner study, women were recruited from online daters, a relatively higher risk group. 50% had a new partner during the study, an instance of new or high risk, new high risk or oncogenic HPV detection was 2.95 per 100 person years. In the study in Baltimore, a lower risk population, 10% had a new male partner. Instance was lower. And in these two studies, based on association between new HPV and risk behavior, it was estimated that in women with a new partner, most but not all detections were attributable to a newly acquired infection. Now, because a recent new partner is a risk for acquiring HPV, we looked at the percent of females and males in the United States with a new partner in the last year by age group. Females on the left, the percent with a new partner in 20 to 24-year-olds was 31.9%, and this decreased with increasing age. And similarly for males on the right, in, that, in the youngest age group, 20 to 24, 39.6% had a a new partner in the last year, and this also decreased with increasing age. Now, much of the change in sexual behavior, of course, is due to um, marital status, and this shows marital status by five-year age groups for females. Categories are never married in orange, married in darker blue, not married but living with a partner in the light blue, and widow divorced or separated in yellow at the top. While 17% of 20 to 24-year-olds were married, this increased to over 50% by 30 to 34 years and over 60% by 40 to 44 years. And the percent widowed, separated, or divorced increases with increasing age. The data are slightly different for males, but show uh, generally similar trends. And these are the data of uh, at least one partner in the past year by sex and age group and also stratified by marital status, looking at married or living with a partner versus the other age groups and you can, I mean, the other categories, and you can see, as expected, the percent with a new partner is markedly lower in those married or living with a partner and is lower with increasing age in both, age, in both uh, categories. So understanding the potential benefit of vaccination in men adults is complex. HPV is common. Infection occurs soon after sexual activity. There's challenges in studying HPV incidence, and HPV detection cannot distinguish between new, persistent, and redetection of infection. But new infections do occur in adults, and sex with a new partner is a risk factor. The percent of adults with a new partner last year decreases in older age groups. Contributing to the complexity of this issue is that not, not all individuals develop antibody, and this is lower in males and females. There's uncertainty about immunity after clearance of infection, and importantly, no protective level of antibody has been identified. In the next part of this um, presentation, I'm going to talk about vaccine effectiveness studies. As background to this section, as reviewed earlier, high efficacy was found in the clinical trials in mid-adult women in the per-protocol analysis, but lower in the intention-to-treat analyses, women who included women, that included women who were positive at the time of, enroll, uh, time of vaccination. And the ITT population might be a better reflection 
of effectiveness that would be observed in a catch-up program in this age group. Effectiveness studies can also provide information on the real-world effectiveness of vaccine and vaccination program, and studies in countries with catch-up vaccination have been able to evaluate effectiveness by age of vaccination. We reviewed post-licensure effectiveness studies that included an analysis by age of vaccination, and we limited this to evaluation of three doses of vaccine. And we extracted basic information, including design, age at outcome, and vaccination, and buffer period. Buffer period is the time between vaccination and case counting, and this is important as a short time between vaccination and case counting causes outcomes to be more likely due to infection that's prevalent at the time of vaccination. And studies with different buffer periods could produce different results. And shorter buffer periods can result in an underestimation of vaccine effectiveness in some age groups. 11 studies were identified and reviewed to evaluate vaccine type prevalence, five in a general warts, and four cervical lesions. And the countries where these evaluations were done are listed on the slide, and I'm going to discuss these outcomes separately. First, outcomes of vaccine type prevalence. Both of these studies included women who were being screened for cervical cancer and were conducted in the U.S. and Scotland. One study was using quadrivalent and one bivalent. Both evaluated prevalence among women in their 20s, and the forest plot of results by age of vaccination are shown. For both studies, prevalent reduction was greater for vaccination at the younger age group. The first study looked at just two groups, less than 19 and greater than equal to 19. And the second was a large national study that was able to evaluate data by individual year of age at vaccination. For those vaccinated 12 to 13 years, the risk reduction was 0.11. And for those 18 or older, it was 0.71. There were five studies that examined the outcome of anagenital warts conducted in Sweden, Belgium, the United States, and Canada. And you can see some of these use these large population-based health registries. All studies were done in countries that introduced quadrivalent vaccine. The first study looked at multiple different age groups from 10 to 13 to greater than or equal 27. And the largest risk reduction was among those vaccinated at 10 to 13, and there was no risk reduction in those vaccinated in the oldest age group. In the last two studies, the relative risk was greater than one among those vaccinated in the oldest age group, and this was statistically significant in one study. In that study, conducted in one province in Canada, the authors actually state that in the older age group, higher risk women were targeted for vaccination at the beginning of the program. And I want to note that in all of these studies, there are few data on risk factors, and adjustment for differences in vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals was very limited. Four studies evaluated the outcome of CIN2+, from Australia, Sweden, and the U.S. As for the other outcomes, the largest risk reduction observed was for those who received vaccine in the youngest age groups. In three of the four studies, the confidence intervals cross one and no significant reductions were found for women in the oldest age category. In summary, 11 studies were reviewed, conducted in six different countries, all found lower effectiveness with increasing age at vaccination, and seven found no effectiveness in the oldest age group. Now, intention to treat analyses in the vaccine trials can help explain some of the findings in these post-licensure effectiveness studies. As in the post-licensure effectiveness studies in catch-up age groups specifically, the ITT population includes individuals who had vaccine-type infection at the time of vaccination. And shown here are data from one, one of the pivotal, pivotal efficacy trials in women 16, 16 through 26 years. And as you can see in the figure, no efficacy was observed in the first year after vaccination. Among those with an endpoint within the first year of follow-up, most cases in both the vaccine and the control group had evidence infection or disease at the time of enrollment. During the second year of follow-up, incidence of disease associated with vaccine type HPV in the placebo group continued to increase, while in the vaccine group it, it plateaued. And this illustra illustrates the importance of time between vaccination and case counting in the post-licensure effectiveness studies conducted in catch-up populations 
which we've called the buffer period, and could account for the higher risk of outcomes in the vaccinated compared to the unvaccinated populations in some of the studies. In conclusion for this part of my talk on vaccine effectiveness, the estimated vaccine effectiveness was lower with increasing age, and this was is expected due to the higher prevalence at the time of vaccination in older age groups. And there are methodologic challenges for evaluating vaccine effectiveness. There are biases due to differences in vaccinated and unvaccinated persons. Some findings could be the result of higher risk individuals being targeted for vaccination. This was specifically reported in one of the studies. And finally, time between vaccination and case counting likely impacts the ability to observe vaccine effectiveness in the oldest age groups. Because of this, effectiveness, particularly in the oldest age groups, is likely underestimated. Nevertheless, these data support the importance of vaccination in early adolescence. So now I'm going to very, talk very briefly about the global HPV vaccine, some, some issues around global HPV vaccine. This map shows countries with HPV vaccine in their national immunization program as of 2008. While really tremendous progress has made 12 years after the first vaccine licensure, less than half of WHO member states have introduced HPV vaccine into their national program. This slide, a little bit complicated, shows introductions by country category, high income countries, countries that procure vaccine through the Pan American Health Organization. The third bar is non-GAVI and non-PAHO procuring countries, and then GAVI countries, the lowest income countries. And at the bottom is the HPV-associated disease in those countries. Middle income, which is the third bar, and GAVI countries lag far behind high income and PAHO procuring countries in introducing HPV vaccines. Countries that have introduced HPV vaccine account for only 25% of the global target population and only 13 GAVI countries introduced, and those countries have over 50% of the disease burden. And middle-income countries, those non-GAVI, non-PAHO, only 39% have introduced, and those account for a greater disease than high-income and PAHO countries. And there are many reasons for the lag in vaccine introduction, but one encouraging thing is in the past two years, there's been an increasing interest in vaccine introduction in many low-income countries. Because of this increased introduction, interest in introduction, and also because of a 2017 WHO recommendation that countries that introduce vaccine do so initially with a multi-age cohort of 9 to 13 year olds in the first year of the program, the current HPV vaccine supply is insufficient to meet the demand, and some countries have had to delay or will have to postpone introductions. These data are from a recent WHO report that displays current and forecasted demand and supply. The demand caused by routine and the multi-age cohort vaccination is shown in the two shades of green. The supply is shown in yellow. Current supply is the dark yellow. And the supply due to potential new manufacturers in advanced stages of clinical development is shown in the light yellow. This report projects that the imbalance in, of demand and supply is forecasted to grow and remain through 2023 due to an increased number of countries planning HPV vaccine introduction. And from 2024 onward, the supply is expected to meet demand. Well, there's a global shortage of HPV vaccine at the current time in the United States, there's no current and no expected future vaccine shortage. So in summary, I covered a lot of information. First, some data submitted to FDA to support the expanded age range, specifically the randomized controlled trial, which found high efficacy in women naive to vaccine types, but lower efficacy in the intention to treat. Second, data to inform US policy. Considerations including coverage, which is increasing in adolescence and impact of the vaccination program, which has been observed mainly in teen and young adult females. Most adults have been exposed to at least one nonvalent type, but not all types. Incidence is lower at older ages, but new infections do occur in adults, and sex with a new partner is a risk factor. 
Post-licensure effectiveness studies show lower effectiveness with older age at vaccination as expected due to more individuals having already been infected with the time of, at the time of vaccination. In terms of global HPV vaccination, less than 50% of countries have introduced vaccine. There's currently a global vaccine shortage that is limiting introductions in some countries, and there's no current shortage in the United States. I'd like to thank the many people in my, on my team and around CDC who helped with this presentation and all of the people on the ACIP, HPV Vaccine Workgroup, and other contributors. Thank you so much. I think we're going to try to get through these presentations so that we can have plenty of time for discussion. But is there any very quick clarification questions that anyone has? That Can we move on? Great. Thank you. Dr. Midas? Good morning. I'll be presenting the grade for HPV vaccination of mid-adults. This presentation includes the PICO question and outcomes of interest, evidence retrieval methods, list of included studies, outcomes data for efficacy, immunogenicity with supplemental immunobridging data and harms, and then scores evidence types and provides an overall summary of the quality of evidence. The work group's main policy question or PICO question was, should catch-up vaccination with HPV vaccine be recommended for primary prevention of HPV infection and HPV-related disease in U.S. adults aged 27 through 45 years who are not vaccinated previously at the routinely recommended age? The population of interest is U.S. adults aged 27 through 45 years, which we're calling the mid-adult age range. The intervention is vaccination with the complete three-dose series of HPV vaccine. And note that data were considered for all three licensed HPV vaccines, but only nine-valent vaccine is available in the United States. The comparison is no HPV vaccination, and the outcomes of interest include important and critical HPV vaccine-related benefits and harms and are listed in detail in the next two slides. This table and the next one show important and critical outcomes relevant to HPV vaccination as determined by the work group. This table shows benefits. Outcomes of interest include persistent vaccine type HPV infection, anogenital warts, also known as condyloma or external genital lesions, uh, cervical or anal intraepithelial neoplasia, abbreviated CIN or AIN, and a combined endpoint reporting any of the above. Although HPV causes various cancers, including anal, cervical, oropharyngeal, penile, vaginal, and vulvar cancer, these were not included in our evidence profile. No HPV-related cancers were reported in per-protocol analyses for many of the studies we reviewed. However, these outcomes are not necessarily expected in clinical trials of the current size or duration. We did review data on immunogenicity, which is a surrogate marker for prevention of these clinical outcomes. And these include rates of seroconversion, which means having any detectable vaccine type antibody after vaccination, and geometric mean titers, or GMTs, which quantify antibody levels. In the second column, only HPV-related cancers and precancers such as CIN2+, were considered critical outcomes. Anogenital warts were considered important rather than critical because they're not life-threatening, and persistent HPV infection, mild dysplasia such as CIN1, were considered important rather than critical because most cases regress without treatment. Immunogenicity is a surrogate marker for clinical efficacy and was also considered important. This table shows harms. Outcomes of interest include serious adverse events, any or those that were vaccine-related, and deaths, any or those that were vaccine-related. For evidence retrieval, we conducted a systematic review of HPV vaccine clinical trials in Medline, Embase, CINAHL, the Cochrane Library, and clinicaltrials.gov published between 2006, when the first HPV vaccine was licensed in the United States, and last week. And we were specifically looking for clinical trials of HPV vaccination in 27 through 45-year-olds. And the exact search terms will be listed on the next slide. In addition, efforts were made to obtain unpublished or other relevant data. And specifically, we reviewed previous ACIP presentations to impress Cochrane reviews on immunobridging conducted for SAGE, 
data in the FDA label for nine-valent HPV vaccine, which was updated October 5th, and clarification of previously published data from the va vaccine manufacturer. And the search strategy for each of the five databases is listed here in tiny print, uh, and each includes terms to identify clinical trials using HPV vaccines and including mid-adults. These searches identified 1,388 references. After reviewing titles and abstracts, we selected 100 references mentioning age 27 and older for detailed review. Of these, 16 trials were selected for inclusion, and 84 papers were excluded, 50 because they included duplicate data, and the others because they did not address our PICO question for reasons listed here. The evidence tables we're presenting today reference these 16 trials, the ACIP presentation from June on clinical data submitted to FDA supporting nine-valent vaccine use in mid-adults, and personal communication from the vaccine manufacturer providing additional analyses of previously published data limited to the age group of interest here. Supplemental data for immunobridging included an additional six articles reporting immunogenicity and efficacy data from six from young adults, and two ACIP presentations from February on nine-valent vaccine safety. For ACIP, evidence types are ranked either one, high, two, moderate, three, low, or four, very low. And initial evidence types in grade are either a type one for randomized control trials or else a type three for observational studies. Included studies. Since no studies have specifically examined use of nine-valent vaccine in the mid-adult age range, the included studies involve either quadrivalent or bivalent vaccine, plus supplemental immunobridging data. For quadrivalent vaccine, there were seven included trials. When multiple references are listed in the same row, it means they report data from different time points in the same study. Note in the first row, the Luxembourg 2018 reference is the ACIP presentation on the observational long-term follow-up study after the base randomized control trial was complete. Of the included studies, three were randomized placebo-controlled trials and four were observational trials since they did not include a control group. These are pretty large trials from multiple countries, each with hundreds of to thousands of participants and lasting for months to years. Most included women only, but two of the smaller trials focused on men. And note that throughout we took a conservative approach of uh, grading the per-protocol results for benefits since, as you just heard, the intention to treat results depend on HPV prevalence and past exposure at the time of vaccination, and this varies by population. Uh, and we also graded intention to treat results for harms. For bivalent vaccine, there were four included trials. Two were randomized placebo-controlled trials and two were observational trials since they did not include a control group. And again, these are large trials from multiple countries, each with hundreds or thousands of participants and lasting for months to years. And all of the bivalent vaccine trials included women only. Supplemental data may not directly address the PICO question and is not included in the formal grade scoring, but it may be helpful for decision making. And here we included immunobridging data by age group and by vaccine. Across the top, two analyses compared immunogenicity of quadrivalent vaccine among mid-adults versus young adults and showed non-inferior immunogenicity. The trial in males in the top row also included clinical efficacy outcomes. In the middle, two trials compared immunogenicity of nine-valent HPV vaccine versus quadrivalent HPV vaccine and showed non-inferior immunogenicity. And across the bottom, two surveillance systems report post-licensure safety data for nine-valent vaccine in the United States. And here are the studies providing evidence regarding benefits. First, the efficacy studies for each clinical outcome and then the immunogenicity studies. This set of tables shows the vaccine administered on the left, the reference and the outcome being evaluated in the middle, and the results for both the vaccine group and the comparison group toward the right. The right-hand column in bold gives the observed efficacy after comparing the two groups. For HPV infection persisting at least six or 12 months, in three RCTs, HPV vaccines had an observed efficacy of 88.8 to 91.4%, and the confidence intervals were all positive. 
Remember that for benefits, we used grade only for per protocol results, and the intention to treat results would have had lower observed efficacy, as you heard in Dr. Markowitz's presentation. For anogenital warts, in two separate RCTs and an observational follow-up, HPV vaccine had an observed efficacy of 100%, with a very wide confidence interval that includes the null. The long-term follow-up study could not calculate efficacy because there was no placebo group left after everyone in the, who completed the base study was offered vaccine. And the second RCT could not calculate efficacy because no cases of anogenital warts were observed after 48 months in either the vaccine group or the placebo group. For vaccine type related CIN of any grade, in three RCTs, HPV vaccines had an observed efficacy of 83.7 to 100%, and the confidence intervals were all positive. There was no placebo group in the long-term follow-up study. For vaccine type related CIN2+, in the same three RCTs, HPV vaccines had a similar observed efficacy of 79.8 to 100%, but with wider confidence intervals that include the null. Again, there was no placebo group in the long-term follow-up study. Looking at the combined endpoint of any of the above HPV-related clinical outcomes, across three RCTs, HPV vaccines had an observed efficacy of 87.7 to 90.6%, and the confidence intervals were all positive. The long-term study, the long-term follow-up study was observational. It had no placebo group. Here are the studies providing data on vaccine immunogenicity. Early immunogenicity results are from month seven, which is one month post-completion of a three-dose series of HPV vaccine, and later immunogenicity results shown are the latest available from each study. This set of tables shows the vaccine administered on the left, the reference and the vaccine type antibody in the middle, along with the number of months. The columns in the middle show the number and percent of people who became seropositive after receiving vaccine in bold, and the right-hand column shows GMTs quantifying the amount of antibody detected. For early immunogenicity of quadrivalent vaccine, across five studies, seroconversion ranged from 93.6 to 100%, and GMTs were high. For early immunogenicity of bivalent vaccine, across four studies, seroconversion ranged from 99 to 100%, and GMTs were also high. For later immunogenicity of quadrivalent vaccine, across four studies, seropositivity ranged from 85.3 to 97.3% for most vaccine types, but was noticeably lower for HPV type 18, with a range of 37.6 to 69% seropositive at three and a half to five years after completing the vaccination series. For later immunogenicity of bivalent vaccine, across three studies, seropositivity ranged from 93.7 to 100% in four to 10 years after completing the vaccination series. Before presenting the supplemental data for immunogenicity, I'd like to explain immunobridging studies. The minimum threshold level of HPV antibodies required for clinical protection has not been established and might vary depending on the assay. Data from clinical trials suggests that this minimum level of antibody needed for protection is below that which can be detected by current assays. Immunobridging studies are used to compare immunogenicity in a group of interest, for example, those aged 27 through 45 years, with a comparison group in which efficacy has been demonstrated, for example, those aged 20, uh, 16 through 26 years. Non-inferiority criteria are met when the lower bound of the 95% confidence interval for the ratio comparing the two groups is not less than a preset value such as 0.5. Immunobridging data contributed to the evidence base for nonvalent HPV vaccine licensure, including for the mid-adult age group. This table and the next ones provide supplemental immunobridging data, and this one is for bridging across age groups. On the left, you see the vaccine administered, and then the reference with the study population and vaccine type antibody and number of months. 
The middle three columns show, show zero conversion and GMTs for the intervention of interest, followed by three columns showing zero conversion and GMTs for the comparison group. The right-hand column in bold shows the GMT ratio comparing these two groups. This table shows that for quadrivalent vaccine, two large trials showed that immunogenicity among mid-adults was non-inferior to immunogenicity for young adults. Looking at the GMT ratios on the right, some indicate that GMTs may be lower in the mid-adult age group compared with young adults, but all of these are considered to meet non-inferiority criteria. And because there's no efficacy study in males for either nine-valent or quadrivalent vaccine, the quadrivalent immunogenicity results from younger males can be used to extrapolate clinical efficacy using results from the quadrivalent efficacy trial in young adult men. This slide shows that in the initial clinical trial among young adult males, quadrivalent HPV vaccine had an observed efficacy of 73% or higher for the clinical outcomes listed, including persistent HPV infection, condyloma, and anal intraepithelial neoplasias. And note that these data were included in the original grade for nine-valent HPV vaccine, which was first presented to ACIP in 2014 with the published version linked here. This table shows supplemental immunobridging data across vaccines in the younger age group. Across the top, you can see that the comparisons groups here received either vaccination with nine-valent HPV vaccine in the middle or quadrivalent HPV vaccine toward the right. And the column on the right-hand side, again, shows the GMT ratio comparing the two groups. This table shows that in three large trials conducted among young adult females and males, immunogenicity of nine-valent vaccine was non-inferior to immunogenicity for quadrivalent vaccine. For HPV type 16 and most other HPV types protected against by both the quadrivalent and nine-valent vaccines, the confidence intervals include the null. And note that for the five additional HPV types protected against by the nine-valent vaccine only, no comparisons were possible and no immunobridging can be done. Moving on, here are the trials providing evidence regarding harms for our PICO question. Note the accumulated evidence regarding safety of HPV vaccines is much broader than the data that will be presented here, which is limited to trials in the mid-adult age range only. In seven pre-licensure studies, nine-valent vaccine was well-tolerated in over 15,000 study participants with similar adverse event profile to that of quadrivalent vaccine. And since 2014 in the United States, over 29 million doses of nine-valent HPV vaccine have been distributed. This set of tables shows the vaccine administered on the left, the reference and the outcome being evaluated in the middle, the time frame for evaluation and number of months, and the number of cases in the vaccine group and in the placebo group on the right. For serious adverse events of any kind, the numbers were similar among the vaccine group and the placebo group across six studies. For serious adverse events that were deemed possibly vaccine-related, numbers were smaller, but again similar among the vaccine group and the placebo group across six studies. For deaths due to any cause across seven studies, overall numbers were low, but appeared to be slightly higher in the vaccine group than in the placebo group. Each cause of death is listed, and you can see that these include a range of causes, including road traffic accident, tuberculosis, homicide, and others, and occurring months to years after vaccination. We noted there was one death due to cervical cancer in the vaccine group of the Wheeler study, which was felt to be due to an HPV infection acquired before vaccination. And as a reminder, we looked at intention to treat results for harms purposefully with the aim of identifying the most possible data. And uh, furthermore, for vaccine-related deaths, the numbers dropped down to zero for all groups across eight studies. Two previous ACIP presentations uh, summarized safety data on nine-valent HPV vaccine, and this slide summarizes U.S. post-licensure safety data for over 29 million doses of nine-valent vaccine. In VSD, for a list of pre-specified adverse events, 
A signal was detected for syncope and injection site reactions, and initially detected signals were not confirmed for allergic reactions or appendicitis since follow-up analyses showed no increased risk, and no signal was detected for anaphylaxis or for any of the other harms listed. In VAERS, out of a total of 8,529 reports of potential adverse events following nine-valent HPV vaccination in the United States, there were 73 involving mid-adults aged 27 through 45 years. Three were considered serious adverse events and none were deaths. And now for the grade evidence types for benefits and then harms. Here is the grade table for benefits of nine-valent HPV vaccine in mid-adults. On the left is a summary finding regarding each of the outcomes presented, and across the top we have the elements for rating the quality of the evidence. Initial evidence level was one for high quality evidence for each outcome based on data from randomized controlled trials. All were downgraded for indirectness since no studies reported data on use of nine-valent vaccine in the mid-adult age range, and extrapolation to nine-valent from quadrivalent vaccine was based on immunobridging data. Outcomes for which the 95% confidence interval crossed one were further downgraded for imprecision. Reading across each row, this table shows that for adults aged 27 through 45 years, we identified level two or moderate quality evidence that nine-valent vaccine prevents greater than six-month persistent HPV infection. Level three or low quality evidence that nine-valent vaccine prevents anogenital warts. Level two or moderate quality evidence that nine-valent vaccine prevents CIN of any grade. Level three or low quality evidence that nine-valent vaccine prevents uh, CIN2+. Plus. Level two or moderate quality evidence that nine-valent vaccine prevents the above HPV-related outcomes combined and level two or moderate quality evidence that nine-valent vaccine is immunogenic in the mid-adult age group. The work group also wanted to be transparent about the differing amount of evidence for benefits from women versus men in the mid-adult age range, so we made two additional versions of this table. Um, this version scores the evidence on benefits for mid-adult women it's the same as the previous table, except that in the second column about study design, you can see the changes in blue. Uh, all of the trials were in women, except in the bottom row. Instead of three RCTs and six observational studies about immunogenicity, here there are three RCTs and five observational studies about immunogenicity. And the evidence types in the right-hand column do not change. However, for mid-adult men, the evidence types in the right-hand column do change. One observational study about immunogenicity was conducted in men with efficacy for other outcomes extrapolated based on immunobridging. The previous studies in women are still indirectly applicable to men, so the evidence type for each outcome can be further downgraded for indirectness. All of the evidence type listed on the right decreased by one additional level for low to very low quality of evidence. Here's the grade table for harms for mid-adults. All of the initial evidence levels were one for high quality evidence, and all were downgraded one level for indirectness given the extrapolation required to bridge to nine-valent vaccine. Reading across each row, this table shows that for female and male adults aged 27 through 45 years, we identified level two or moderate quality evidence that there were similar numbers of severe adverse events with nine valent HPV vaccine versus placebo and few vaccine related severe adverse events. And level two or moderate quality evidence that there were similar numbers of deaths with nine valent HPV vaccine versus placebo and no vaccine related deaths. In summary, for benefits, Comparing HPV vaccine for mid-adults age 27 through 45 years versus no vaccination, nine-valent vaccine is more efficacious against HPV-related outcomes than no vaccination, with level two or moderate quality evidence for women and level three or low quality evidence for men. And nine-valent vaccine is immunogenic with level two or moderate quality evidence, and the overall evidence type for benefits is level two. For harms, 
Comparing HPV vaccination for mid-adults aged 27 through 45 years versus no vaccination, there were similar harms among people receiving placebo versus nine-valent HPV vaccine, which with level two or moderate quality evidence, there were few vaccine-related serious adverse events and no vaccine-related deaths. The overall evidence type for harms is also level two. And here are all the references cited in this presentation. And I'd like to acknowledge the members of the HPV Vaccines Work Group and CDC contributors. Thank you. Thank you so much. Any questions, clarifications before we move on? OK, we'll move on to Dr. Chesson. Good morning. Uh, for those watching online, I want to fill you in on what's going on. The people here in attendance have noticed from my title slide um, <clears throat> that we're going to talk about three models of HPV cost effectiveness and not just one. So as you might guess, there's a wave of excitement sweeping over the room. So <clears throat> it, it's, it's an electric atmosphere like I've never seen before. So I wish you were here to see it in person. Before we dive into it, though, I have to give a disclaimer that the ACIP Health Economics Review is still ongoing. Normally, the completion of the review is required before we give this information, but we've been granted a waiver in order to let you know where we stand with the HPV modeling. So today's results should be considered preliminary. So what do we know about HPV vaccine cost effectiveness in the US? We know that routine vaccination of 11 to 12 year olds is likely to be cost saving. When we expand vaccination uh, to older age groups, as with the current recommendation, that expansion has a favorable cost effectiveness profile as well. And we know that vaccination of adults becomes less cost effective as the age of vaccination increases, the age of vaccination increases. <clears throat> so the new cost effectiveness question now that we have to answer is what is the cost effectiveness of mid-adult vaccination? So specifically, what is the cost effectiveness of extending the upper recommended age of ketchup vaccination to as high as 45 years. And I'll have to say, too, that I'm not really sure about this mid-adult terminology because I'm over the 45 cutoff age. And I don't know what label comes after mid-adult, but I'm guessing it's not very flattering. So, I'm <laughs> <clears throat> so for, for the, the talk today, what I'll do is briefly give a summary of cost effectiveness ratios for other vaccines in order to put uh, the mid-adult cost effectiveness ratios in perspective. I'll give an overview of the three models that we're using for nonvalent, and I'll show the results of one particular model, and then I'll compare the results across three models. So what I've done is to compile cost effectiveness ratios from ACIP publications. And this shows the childhood vaccines. Many other childhood vaccines have been shown to be cost saving, but because they were not noted as such in the ACIP reports, they're not included in the table. Moving on to the adolescent and adult vaccines, there's a big range for these adolescent vaccines, ranging from cost saving for Tdap to one to two hundred thousand dollars per quality adjusted life year gained for uh, influenza, and then uh, meninge B with the cost per quality gain ratios of, of over a million dollars. And then for adults, there are some vaccines that are cost saving, such as uh, influenza, and also zoster seems to have a, a very favorable cost effectiveness ratio. This table shows the HPV vaccine strategies that have been evaluated over time. And when we first started out, we, we estimated that the vaccination of adolescent females would cost $5,000 to $30,000 per quality. Recent studies, we've looked at, uh, for example, comparing nine-valent to four-valent and found that was cost-saving, and two doses was cost-saving compared to three doses. So that's why early Early on, we did not uh, say that HPV vaccination was cost-saving, but the reason we do now uh, is because of the two-dose schedule and the nonvalent vaccine, among other issues. So now I'll move on to an overview of the three models that we're using for nonvalent vaccine. Before doing so, I just wanted to show a schematic of a hypothetical HPV model just to uh, indicate to give you a flavor of how difficult it is to do these models, we have to take into account HPV transmission. Things like that also require accounting for natural immunity. We also have to think about the natural history of disease, also cervical cancer screening, 
and then we have a variety of the outcomes attributable to HPV. This will be difficult enough if there were just one type, but we have all the types in the vaccine. And then we have to think about cost and quality of life impacts of these outcomes. So the message here is that the modeling is very hard. So later on in the presentation, if the results of the model don't happen to quite line up across the models very much, hopefully you will be understanding. <clears throat> So this is the three models of nonvalent vaccination that I'll be presenting today. There's the U.S. HPV advised model, the simplified model, and the Merck model. And now I'll move on and uh, describe these models in a little bit more detail. All three of these models are dynamic. That means they include transmission or, or herd effects of vaccination. All of the models include a wide range of health outcomes, such as cervical and other cancers. One difference is that the HPV advised model does not include RRP. All of the models apply uh, recently published, uh, up, uh, updated uh, direct medical cost estimates for HPV associated cancers, and all of the models use updated vaccine costs. The simplified model has been used to examine a wide range of HPV vaccination strategies. Uh, the results have often been similar to those of the more complex models. And the model has been very useful, but it's not always suitable or sufficient for all the analyses we need to do because of the key simplifications. And because of this, we have been collaborating with the HPV advised modelers from the University of Laval in Canada uh, to address the full range of ACIP needs. So this HPV advised model, as I mentioned, it's developed initially for Canada, and then we've had it funded the adaptation of the model to U.S. data. And this U.S. version of the model has been used extensively as well, uh, both at, uh, by ACIP and other governmental and health organizations. The Merck model as well has been used to examine a wide range of HPV vaccination strategies and has been uh, presented at uh, every uh, HPV-related ACIP meeting regarding cost-effectiveness. <clears throat> and all of the model equations have been published, and like the other models, it has been used by other governmental and health organizations. I'll show some of the selected model features across the models. The HPV advised model is individual based. It keeps track of individual people in the model, whereas the, other, the two other models are compartmental. They keep track, uh, keep track of groups of people. In the HPV advised and Merck model, people can be infected, recover, and infected again. In the simple model, people who are infected cannot be infected again. The study approach used in the HPV advised and Merck model is similar to what's going on now, where we have an HPV vaccine program in place for 10 to 12 years, and then we look at the addition of a mid adult vaccination program. The simple model cannot uh, change vaccine strategies midstream, so it just looks at 100 years of a vaccine program with mid-adult vaccination compared to 100 years of a vaccination program without mid-adult vaccination. As far as natural immunity goes, there's uh, the simple model does not have reinfection, so you can think of that as 100% uh, developing lifelong natural immunity after infection, whereas the HPV advise and Merck model do allow for some degree of natural immunity. The HPV advised and simplified model assume 95% efficacy against infection, and it's this protection against, efficacy, protection against infection that leads to reduction in the HPV-associated diseases. The Merck model is a little bit different in that it models specific efficacy against transient infection, persistent infection, and disease. In the HPV advised and Merck model, the vaccine is assumed to provide protection against reinfection. The HPV advised and simplified model use NIS teen coverage estimates for the base case, and the Merck model uses NHANES. And the probability of vaccination among mid adults is different in the models. The HPV advised and simplified model assume roughly 2.6% of unvaccinated women and 1.9% of unvaccinated men are vaccinated each year, whereas in the Merck model it's, it's a bit lower, such that about 2.4% and 1% of the eligible women and men, respectively, are vaccinated over the 100 year period. So now I'll move on to the results of the HPV advised model. This slide shows the percentage reduction in four outcomes following onset of HPV vaccination, CIN, cervical cancer, androgenital warts, and non-cervical HPV cancers. What is shown here is the, the blue line shows the current recommendation, and the red line shows what happens when we add mid-adults 
to the current recommendation. And it looks kind of like one line on your slide, and the reason for that is that the marginal impact of adding the adult vaccination is so low, we can't uh, distinguish the difference. So I'll show a couple of other slides to help clarify this. So if, uh, before doing so, if you look at the anal genital warts, for example, with the current recommendation, there's 32 million cases averted, and then expanding it to include the uh, Mid adults up through age 45, we have about 313,000 additional cases. So this will make uh, the next slides more clear, keeping those numbers in mind. <clears throat> this shows the health outcomes prevented over 100 years with the current recommendation compared to no vaccination. So the, this is in thousands. So as I mentioned for angenital warts, there's roughly uh, 32 million cases averted over the 100 years. <clears throat> The next slide, I will show this the same layout, except it will show the marginal impact of the mid-adult vaccination, and you'll notice the the, number, the scale on the left axis will change. So it's now down into the hundreds instead of the uh, tens of thousands. So, for example, the uh, dark red bar for anogenital warts corresponds to the 312 million additional cases uh, prevented that I showed on the, the previous slide. Um, if we extended vaccination just to age 30 years, as shown by the lighter blue, then it looks like about 180 million additional cases averted. This table shows the number needed to vaccinate to prevent one outcome for the four outcomes shown here. So for example, um, with the current recommendation, compared to no vaccination, there's one death averted for every 605 people vaccinated. However, if we expand vaccination to include ages up to 45, then it takes about uh, 10,500 additional people vaccinated per death averted. This table, sh this chart shows the incremental cost and health benefits. So the incremental health care costs saved are shown on the left. This does not have anything to do with vaccination costs. It just shows the medical cost averted by preventing HPV associated health outcomes. And as the previous slides have shown, the bulk of the benefits come from the current recommendation shown by the first bar. And then, as you'll see, adding the uh, older age groups has uh, a smaller mar marginal effect. And the same uh, trend holds for the incremental quality adjusted life years gained. This table shows the cost effectiveness ratios in the HPV advised models. And there, uh, there's a lot of numbers here, so I'll try to go through this uh, systematically and, <clears throat> and hope it makes sense. So what the first row says is that if we have a vaccination program up to age 17 for both sexes, that that's considered cost-saving compared to no vaccination. Then if we extend that uh, to the current recommendation, 26 for females, 21 for males, the cost per quality gained is about $33,000. You'll notice that there is the, the word dominated on the, the, for the next strategy, and I want to explain that. If we did have a cost per quality there, it would be somewhere in the neighborhood of $350,000. And you'll notice that's a bit higher than the, the cost per quality of the next strategy. So when a, when a strategy is followed uh, by a more effective strategy that has a lower cost per quality, we call that strategy dominated, and we remove it from the comparison. So what we do now is we compare both sexes aged 30 years to the current recommendation, and the cost per quality for that, the incremental cost per quality, is $204,000. Then the next two numbers show what happens when we move the cutoff age from 30 to 35, and then from 35 to 40. So there's a big jump in the HPV advised model when we go from 35 to 40, of roughly $1.6 million per quality gained. And then the last strategy is listed as dominated. The reason for this is in the HPV advised model, they, they could find no consistent population level health benefits of changing the cutoff from age 40 to 45. So it, since it had no additional health benefits, it was labeled dominating, dominated. <clears throat> so to summarize the HPV advised cost effectiveness results, the current HPV vaccination program appears to offer a good value for the cost, and the main reason for that is that vaccination of adolescents appears to be cost-saving. And extending HPV vaccination above age 26 results in a substantially higher cost per quality gained. So now I'll move on to show the results across all of the models. The first row of results shows the HPV advised model results that were shown on the previous slide. For simplicity, we've reduced the number of strategies that we're showing here. <clears throat> 
The simplified model has a higher cost per quality gained for ages 30 and 35, but it does not increase as rapidly as the HPV advised model, so it does not uh, have that big jump that uh, the, shown in the HPV advised model when going from 35 to 40. And then the Merck model results uh, show the same trend in that the cost per quality gained increases with age at vaccination, but their cost per quality estimates are notably lower. So what explains the differences across the models? There's no one single factor that accounts for the different results. Um, we're looking at a whole range of factors to understand this better, and I'll just show a couple of examples now, two of the important uh, factors that we've found so far. The first is natural immunity assumptions. In general, the cost per quality gained decreases as the degree of natural immunity decreases. All else equal, if a model has uh, lower natural immunity, then it'll result in a lower cost per quality. So the simplified model assumes 100% uh, natural immunity, and that can explain why its cost per quality estimates are a bit higher than the other two uh, for some of the vaccination strategies. And the HPV advised model assumptions may result in a higher effective degree of natural immunity than the Merck model, and I'll show the impact of that uh, in this table. What this shows is the Merck model uh, base case results and the HPV, at mo HPV advised model base case results. Uh, the first row shows vaccination through age 30 years compared to the current recommendation. And in that, as shown before, the HPV advised model base case was 204,000. In the lower natural immunity assumption scenarios, the cost per quality is 146,000, but in the higher natural immunity assumptions, it's closer to uh, 230,000. And the same uh, relative trend holds when looking at vaccination through age 40 years compared to the current recommendation. As far as vaccination coverage assumptions go, the preliminary results so far in the HPV advised and simplified model, uh, these results are not particularly sensitive to moderate changes in coverage. However, in the Merck model, the cost per quality gained by mid-adult vaccination increases with higher historic coverage assumptions. So as I mentioned, the, the Merck model looks at introducing mid-adult vaccination to an established HPV vaccination program. So if they assume higher coverage at the time, you know, in the first 10 to 12 years, then they have a higher cost per quality of adult vaccination. So, for example, in their base case, using the NHANES coverage assumptions, the cost per quality gained was $85,000. When they use the NIS teen coverage assumption, it's $171,000. So our next steps, as I mentioned, the ACIP review of the models is ongoing, and we will continue working uh, with across the modeling groups to document the main differences in the model structures and assumptions to better understand the implications of these differences. For example, we know that the implied median age at which causal H HPV infection acquired for cervical cancer, we know that that median age differs across the models. And we want to address feedback from the ACIP review and we want to provide more details uh, to the work group in subsequent presentations. So for the February ACIP meeting, we want to give more details of the models. Uh, I did not go into details about the assumptions and the limitations and the sensitivity analyses and so forth. Uh, we want to res uh, provide responses to the health economic reviews. And of course, we want to provide responses to whatever feedback you have for us uh, today. And I want to thank all the modelers who have provided their preliminary results. And at this point, I would like to see if there's any comments uh, from the modelers uh, who want to add to this presentation. Thank you so much for that presentation. It looks like we do have one uh, comment from the audience. Please uh, just state your name and uh, your affiliation, please. Okay. Uh, sorry. Good morning. Uh, I am Lamino Vaisha, a health economist with Merck. As Hal mentioned, we are health economists. We're exciting. So. <laughs> Uh, thank you for the presentation and the opportunity to comment on, on, on the results of the model. Uh, and you had a very clear presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, I, the, the fact that the, the three models produce different results is a little bit surprising to us, given the fact that in previous uh, reviews, actually, the model were aligned when evaluating younger age groups. And so it is really important to figure out the differences, and we welcome the next step that you outline in terms of understanding uh, the structural differences, especially regarding the key assumptions that drive the results, as well as the inputs that actually produce those different results. 
Uh, I think you outlined uh, uh, two important ones that I think are, are really relevant to this uh, uh, age group recommendation. One is the natural history assumptions, and the other one is the median age of infection. So if you look at the first one, actually, if you look at the simplified model, uh, I think it makes uh, the assumption that recovery from infection is not taken into account. And that is fundamentally inconsistent with the natural history of HPV infection. Uh, in our preliminary analysis, when we relax that assumption, the results actually change dramatically uh, for, for vaccinating this age group. Regarding the median age of infection, in the HPV advised model, and I, I don't think you showed this in the presentation, it shows that most infection happened before age 18. Uh, so the median age of infection is around 18 years of age. Uh, by the time that a person is 26 or 27, about 80% of infection actually happened. And therefore, the benefit of vaccination of this age group as predicted by that model is going to be much lower. So uh, I think we have a, a lot of work ahead of us actually to try to align on the assumptions and figure out all those differences. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, one more comment. Uh, thank you. I, I did have a question for you. I'm not a modeler, though. Um, uh, I have a question regarding the, um, um, in all of the models, you include current recommendation, and then you say females and males at certain ages. And I imagine that includes catch-up vaccination. <clears throat> and one issue that comes up with pediatricians that um, uh, in practice is the issue of the gap between the children who were vaccinated with the two and four valent versus the nine valent. And I just, back of the envelope here, I'm looking at the kids who, um, if you're assuming that the vaccine for girls was licensed in 2006 and then for males in 2010, and you're looking at, say, a nine to 12 year old age range for first vaccination with either two, four versus nine, for a 10-year period between 2006 and 2016 for girls and 2010 to 2016 for boys, there's a group of a birth, a 10 year birth cohort for girls and six-year birth cohort for boys um, who are now between 11 and 24 years of age in girls and 11 and 20 years of age for boys who have not received the nine valent. So they received either two or four or could have. And so the question is, did you are those? Did you model that those catch up vaccines into this or not? Because that's a reasonably substantial number of kids, and we do get questions from our pediatricians about what to do um, regarding those catch up. And in the past, we have heard that those the, there's no recommendation to include them. But I'm wondering if you took that into consideration with your model. Thank you. Yeah, um, my understanding is that the HPV advised model did take those differences into account when it was done. I think one of one of the the main issues, though, is we looked at the marginal Im impact of uh, adult vaccination strategies. So we kind of took the approach that whatever is happening with the young people would be the same in either strategy. So it cancels out when you compare the mid adult vaccination strategy to. Uh, scenario of no mid-adult vaccination strategy. But we'll, we can have a more detailed answer to that question uh, in the future. Dr. Lee? Sorry, one more question for you, which is, um, and actually it relates back to the Future 3 study. I was noticing that there was a, um, certainly a difference in the efficacy between per protocol and intention to treat. Do your vaccine coverage estimates assume per protocol, uh, so series completion, or do you allow for people who um, perhaps start the series but don't complete the series, and do you have variable effectiveness in the model? Yes, the, the models differ a little bit for that. The, the Merck model follows, uh, uh, keeps track of doses. Uh, in our model, we just uh, assume, in the simplified model, we assume that people who are vaccinated uh, all complete the series. Uh, okay. Thank you. Oh, it looks like we have one more question, Dr. Bernstein. I was just a, uh, a bit confused. I mean, this was a great presentation, and it's neat how you've tried to factor everything in. Why would the th Why wouldn't you... Um, consider the person infected recovering and then 
uh, being infected again in all three models. Why would you, the, the two of the models did not, and the first model, the HPV advised did. Why, why the difference? Why not use the same um, strategy for all three models? The, the simplified model, uh, as one might guess, is a bit simplified compared to the others. So it's, it, one of the simplifying assumptions is, is to estimate the, the impact of vaccination based on the cumulative reduction in lifetime acquisition and it doesn't model natural history from time from infection to disease. It's a major simplification that uh, enables us to, to look at this in a different way than the other two vaccines. So there's uh, limitations to that approach and some benefits as well. Thank you so much. We'll move on. I think Dr. Markowitz has a couple of slides. Um, I do want to acknowledge that it is unusual for us to present economic analyses before they've been fully reviewed, but, but we felt like because of these differences in these models, it was important for you to have a preliminary um, understanding of them, and then you'll hear more in February. So to end this session, I want to review very briefly the work group plans and policy considerations regarding the expanded age range for nine-valent HPV vaccine. So as you heard, the policy question being addressed is should the upper age for HPV vaccine catch a vaccination be expanded beyond the current recommended ages? And before I discuss um, some specific issues regarding this, I want to mention two points. One, that in discussions with the work group members, um, they all felt that they wanted to reinforce the importance of the routine schedule and the fact that HPV vaccine will have greatest impact when administered before onset of sexual activity and HPV exposure. And again, I want to mention that the work group is still reviewing results from the health economic analyses. They only recently were able to see these and also other data related to this policy question. Just a reminder, our current recommendations, routine 11 or 12, uh, catch up through age 26 for females, 21 for males, and certain populations through 26, and males 20 through to 26 may be vaccinated. So these are some of the discussions that the work group was having, of course, for the routine age. There'd be no change based on this expanded age recommendation, I mean the expanded age indication. For routine catch up, um, the work group, work group discussed harmonization of the upper catch up age for females and males. This has been discussed at several ACIP meetings and there's general support for this. And this harmonized age could be the current age at 26 or a different age. And of course, this depends on further considerations um, as I mentioned earlier. Although the work group is still um, reviewing the health economic models, they did consider recommendations if the routine catch-up age is not expanded through age 45. And for persons older than the determined, the determined catch-up age, whatever that is, almost all work group members felt that a recommendation for individual decision-making could be considered, and that individual decision-making would be through 45 years. The work group did discuss the pros and cons of individual decision-making, which used to be called Category B, before that a permissive recommendation, and many workgroup members are aware of the challenges of a recommendation for individual decision-making for other vaccines. However, workgroup members felt that for this vaccine, which has a routine recommendation, as well as a catch-up recommendation in some age groups, that it could be recommended for individual decision-making for individuals beyond the upper age for a routine catch-up. And several liaison organization members are on our workgroup and supported this position. The work group members did briefly discuss that if an individual's decision-making recommendation is made in some age groups, that guidance would be needed. Um, there would have to be discussion about what guidance to provide, how to communicate who might benefit, and also how to communicate the lower effectiveness in this age group. The next steps for the ACIP HPV vaccine work group are further review of the health economic analyses. Um, we 
we reviewed already, but we will summarize the values and acceptability in the expanded age group for ACIP, review data for special populations, discuss policy options, and then complete the full evidence to recommendations framework and to prepare for a potential vote at the February meeting. At this meeting, we would like feedback from the ACIP on specific issues for the catch-up vaccination age group, harmonization of the upper age for the routine recommendations, and again, the strategy that the upper age would be the same or a different age depending on the impact and health, econo health economic analyses and other considerations. And specifically, the work we would like feedback on consideration of a potential recommendation for individual decision making for persons older than the catch up age group through age 45 years. And I think that's my last slide. And I want to thank all the work group members again for a very robust discussion we've had over the past few months. Thank you. Okay, so we have a few minutes for discussion and comments from um, the committee. Um, any questions or anyone want to get started? Dr. Hunter? Uh, thank you very much. So great presentations. I think for me personally, um, it's pretty straightforward that the um, harmonizing the upper age of catch-up at 26 would make it very much easier for especially primary care folks to implement this. And I'm also generally in support, personally, of the um, individual decision-making for the older group. I, the comment I wanted to make was that um, if I understood your presentation earlier about vaccine supply, especially if it, if it is, if the worldwide supply affects our supply in the United States, that for the next five or six years, if we give more vaccine to older um, people, then there's less vaccine that's going to go to younger people. And I don't know if that's been calculated into any of the economic analyses, yeah. that that could have an effect well, on that, too. Well, let me comment on that. We. We've been told that there's no current and they, there's no anticipated vaccine shortage for the United States, and there may be someone here who wants to comment on that. But I wanted to show the supply and demand situation internationally because some of our work group members were aware of that and concerned, and it has been discussed a lot in the international community. But we've been told there's no, there will be no shortage in the U.S. It looks like there's someone who's going to comment on that. But we were told there would not be a shortage of the new shingles vaccine, and that was not the case. Uh, hello, the guests. Um, uh, good morning. My name is John Yakovic uh, from Merck uh, Supply Chain Management. And thanks for the opportunity to speak to the committee today. Uh, several points to share uh, in relation to that question that was asked. Um, so first, we do remain extremely confident uh, that we can meet the forecasted demand uh, for the U.S. market, uh, given that the indication for the 27 to 45-year-old age range uh, has been planned for several years. Um, we can also share and validate that there has been unprecedented increase in worldwide demand for our HPV vaccines. Uh, demand has doubled in the last year alone. Um, this was driven through new and expanded vaccination programs around the world, as mentioned in the previous uh, discussion and review. Notably, the largest increase in demand was driven by policy changes for Gavi countries. Um, so that would be moving from demonstration programs to the multi-age cohorts uh, that was also mentioned. Um, so in Merck, increasing our global supply of HPV vaccines uh, to meet this demand is a top priority. Uh, we do have plans in place to almost triple our supply um, over the next few years uh, based uh, against our 2017 baseline that we have. Uh, looking at 2018, uh, we were able to double our supply of Gardasil to Gavi um, eligible countries compared to 2017 supply. Uh, Gavi country launches um, remain a priority for Merck, and we anticipate uh, that the volume for Gavi launches will represent the majority of our supply increases over the next few years. Uh, the biggest increase in 2019 from 2018 uh, will be for Gavi countries, uh, and that'll bring the 
supply to Gavi in 2019, um, insignificant excess to our supply uh, for the U.S. Um, the final note would be um, that our U.S. supply against our global supply is less than 20 percent. Um, so that keeps us confident uh, to be able to support the U.S. demand that we have out there. Um, so Thank you very much. Time. Thank you. Do you have a quick comment as well? Uh, yes, uh, Leonard Friedland from GSK. Just to give a, an update on what's happening with our HPV vaccines. Uh, as you know, over the last few years, GSK has reduced our manufacturing capacity for our two-valent HPV vaccine in the United States, given the recommendations. But around the world, I think it is important to update on supply. So we've been evaluating the potential to increase our capacity in the medium term to supply the countries as outlined by Dr. Markowitz, where there is an imbalance between supply and demand. So we're looking to increase our capacity to meet the demand for the two-valent vaccine, where it is recommended around the world. Um, so that we can be part and continue to supply vaccine through the national immunization programs to meet the worldwide demand. Thank you. Thank you. I'm um, Dr. Freihofer. Sandra Freihofer, uh, American Medical Association. Um, as a practicing physician, this discussion has been so helpful and really demonstrates the value of ACP and going beyond just FDA licensing and helping clinicians determine which of their patients will benefit from this life-saving cancer vaccine. And it's also, uh, as we've been discussing, a reality check on how our decisions can make uh, an impact globally. And uh, this is a perfect example of how uh, ACIP can help clinicians with value-based care and judicious use of resources. Um, and I congratulate Dr. Markowitz and her team for just an excellent discussion, and I can't wait till February. Great. Uh, Dr. Foster? Steve Foster, American Pharmacists Association. Uh, excellent presentations today. I, I really do appreciate them. Uh, one other thing to mention under the, the uh, individual decision making that may uh, have an effect on that is the accessibility to uh, pharmacies. In many, every state has a different law rule on, on what pharmacists can do. And there are a few states that actually state uh, with regulations that unless it's a quote A category or the, the, old, the recommendation to give as a general thing, pharmacists cannot do that. Pharmacists will become an important part in this type of uh, program because this is the age group that typically gets a lot of their vaccines in a pharmacy. So I wanted you to be aware of that as a possibility um, influence in that. Thank you. Other comments, Dr. Goldman? Thank you, Jason Goldman, American College of Physicians. I want to thank the work group in the ACIP on uh, tackling this very important issue. Certainly, women's health is a very important initiative for the college. Anything we can do to promote that, we certainly uh, are advocating. I think increasing the catch-up age to 26 as well will be very helpful from the primary care perspective. And it would be interesting with the individual decision-making to see the economics of uh, those who are going to be changing their lifestyle at later years in life and how that might affect the decision making as we saw about 27 percent divorce rate or separated by a certain age so that might be a play into the recommendation as to how it affects the quality of life and the cost uh, based on those later years thank you um sorry i know <laughs> sorry dr rockwell Hi, Pamela Rockwell, AAFP. I just want to make another plug as a family physician and a clinician that the harmonization of the ages for males and females would really be helpful, especially in this age of electronic health records where oftentimes much of our support staff is helping us to immunize and these best practice alerts pop up. And if it's not a what we, I think, still call an A recommendation um, comes up, some people are just not up to date and they don't realize that young men who may fall into other categories or who may wish to have the HPV vaccination are eligible and so they're not getting it. Thank you. Dr. Lee? Um, one, I don't know if you can answer this, but one question that I've always struggled with is um, with the individual decision making, uh, it would be helpful to understand what the financial coverage would be and if there would be any disparities in access or subsequent disparities as a consequence of pursuing an individual route, recognizing that there's a lot of evidence to suggest that that uh, might be a reasonable choice. Dr. Fry. 
I would just like to um, build on that thought. Is there a way to look at what the, uh, if a change in recommendation should occur, um, is there a way to look at the impact on demand in general to think, to start to think about whether or not there will be enough drug available or vaccine available to, to meet those demands in a timely manner? Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think at this time, unfortunately, we have to uh, take a break. It is 10.15.